All right, so I'll turn it over to Josh. Okay. Um, just to pick, to close off a little bit of that, so you're not waiting all, all night saying they didn't answer my question. Um, the cybersecurity task force that HHS is doing that Michael McNeil from Phillips is on, um, we're about halfway through, and that is the most pressing issue, is the legacy. So I'll just give you a teaser. If you're from the healthcare world, are you from the healthcare world? Okay. So, so one of the things I put on the table early is uh, when they were trying to go to electronic health records from paper records, they attached reimbursement to this clause called meaningful use. And if you're in the industry, you know, you just got a pang of pain in your body when I said that. But from a security perspective, I basically said, guys, uh, maybe meaningful use was our original sin. Maybe this is why we're so hackable. And essentially what you did is you took devices that were never designed, engineered, threat modeled to ever be connected to anything, and you forced them to connect to everything. And, and you couldn't just go back to the drawing board. So we're gonna pay down that technical debt and security debt for a very long time. And that's why we're gonna have some very uncomfortable brainstorming tomorrow. Can I, can I tie it off for now? Okay. All right, so um, for the camera and the streaming, um, I'm going to do the auto talk a little differently than we intended. I, I had a few automakers that we were going to try to pull up on stage, much like Bo did. Given a few things that are happening, some of them aren't allowed to speak in public yet. Um, but if you're willing to reveal yourself, and I won't put you on the camera or anything, but who from here works in or with the automotive industry? Okay. Good, good, good. So last year we had the privilege of having, I think it was 11 people from Tesla that self-identified in the room. Uh, we had several people from GM, from Ford, from Honda, um, and we're starting to cross our tribes in a very positive way. So I'm gonna change a little bit, in part because I wanna leave some room for more discussion, but I'm gonna show you a talk I give them. So this is not gonna give you O'Day, you're not gonna get new, uh, mind-blowing stuff, but this is gonna be the level, this is a good indicator of the level of dialogue that we need to have and one of the reasons I changed my mind is Mary Barra, the CEO and chairman of, of GM, uh, 10 days ago in, in Detroit, she gave a keynote at a cybersecurity conference. And she is essentially channeling most of these talking points. And, ever, and uh, I was very pleased to see that because that shows how well we've infected that industry that usually was afraid of us to start to like realize how vital uh, a team how uh, about a resource we are if we, if we properly team together. So I'm just gonna show you a very brief version of what we kind of acclimate them to. And I'm gonna leave a little bit of room for some of the things that are happening. If I see Frank as well, we also had Frank from NHTSA, uh, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, so the regulator in this space, spoke earlier today. And If you missed that, just catch the video. Um, I'm sad to say that they were about to release um, their guidance on connected vehicle safety. Um, and it's all done, but they have to wait a few more weeks for government approval, because governments move slow, as he reminded us this morning. Uh, so again, I'm Josh Corman. I'm one of the founders of I'm the Cavalry. And if you weren't here for this morning session, we turned three years old yesterday. So if you've been helping, give yourself a round of applause. Anybody? Come on. No? Nobody's been helping? OK. All right. All right. So um, there's plenty of work to do, and there's plenty of room to help. And I'm just going to show a little bit of that right now. Um, Motivations have turned out, and I actually had a much more detailed version of this this morning, but motivations have turned out to be the biggest obstacle for us working together. They don't understand why anybody would ever hack their vehicles. Why would you do that? Um, and, and I'm not making fun of them, but they have had some bad experiences. Um, it's almost, it's more of an urban legend that white hats go to companies, they say we found a bug and they extort them, right? I've been working, I don't know if you saw Leonard Bailey from the Department of Justice, uh, he was on a panel earlier today with Jen Ellis. They have had almost no extortion cases, almost none. Um, the ones they have had have mostly been misunderstandings, like someone said, hey, I found a bug for you, and before they took a, a pause and a breath, they said, and if you pay me, I will gladly fix it for you. It wasn't really extortion, it was just really terrible communication skills. But I often have to speak to motivations, and this is where I basically point out that you know, just like uh, every car company is not the same, and not everyone who works at your car company is the same, 
Um, white hats have very different motivations as well. So I have a table that I showed this morning. They're all P's, and this is a gross oversimplification. But white hats, or the people who find bugs that aren't criminals, um, they do it for one or more of the following five reasons. They're protectors that want to make the world a safer place. They're puzzlers who do it for challenge, for curiosity, for, for the, you know, they like to solve hard things, take it apart and put it back together. They do it for prestige because they want to win the white jacket or they want to be on CNN or in Wired Magazine. They do it for profit because this is a way to make a living. Um, or they do it for protest, they're for or against something. And when we kind of explain that you know, hacking is magic and there's bad wizards and there's good wizards like Gandalf, thank goodness we had Gandalf, it demystifies it a little bit for them. And when they understand that they're not all out to drop O'Day on stage at DEF CON or they're not all out to make money uh, and that some of these folks, especially these folks, are here because they want to make the world a safer place, it helps them better understand and better structure their coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. So one of the things I want to leave a little bit of time for is have a really honest discussion about where the safety critical industries are at on their coordinated disclosure programs and some of the guidance we've been giving them that you might not agree with at face value, but there's really good reasons we're giving them that guidance. But the point here is that everybody's motivated differently, and for me, I just want to make the world a safer place. Um, but when you know how they're motivated, you know what they're trying to accomplish, it's also a good hacking trick because the people you're going to speak with at these various companies, if it's the general counsel of a car company versus the security team at a car company versus the third-party supply chain part, uh, part of a security uh, car company, they have different wants, needs, and fears. And instead of doing the same thing over and over and over and pointing a finger at something they did wrong, I'm not excusing them, but I know I try to start with what motivates them and then tailor the message to that person. So one of the, the, the warm-ups I do is, you know, the, a lot of the people have heard this Mark Andreessen quote that software is eating the world. And what he means is that every company, regardless of what you do, is now becoming a software company. John Deere does not call themselves a tractor company. They call themselves a software delivery platform. And that's how they self-identify. GE is re re reconstructing its entire company to be the industrial internet. Um, you know, Cisco is talking about the internet of everything. Uh, now, what they mean is this is a business opportunity, and if you aren't good at software, you better get good at software, because if you want to please your shareholders, software is the last mile of differentiation. When I hear it, I hear something different. I hear software is infecting the world, right? We're putting software and weakness and Bluetooth and internet connectivity into every single aspect of our lives. And the number of devices in your home that weren't hackable before that are now hackable is growing, right? It's like a plague. But none of us look at it that way. We kind of think the internet of everything is awesome. Um, but we're not going to feel that way forever. And at some point, um, we'll come to like a, a happy middle ground and we'll realize, okay, sometimes it makes sense to put software and connectivity onto something. And in some case, use cases, it's wildly inappropriate to put Bluetooth. Why do you need Bluetooth on your insulin pump that can kill you? I mean, Jay Radcliffe just talked. That's how he kind of got into this area, is he could do unauthenticated um, communication with his, Bluetooth, with his insulin pump and give himself a lethal dose. I mean, that's kind of what Barnaby Jack was doing when he did his famous uh, hacks on stage, right? Why would you do that? And if, and if you're going to do it, you better be willing to do it in a safe and secure way. You really got to do the threat modeling. You really have to be held to a higher standard. So I couldn't come up with a good metaphor, and I, I'm, I would still prefer a better one from somebody here, because you guys are all smart. But I was fixing my deck, my patio, right? I got my gas grill out there, and I had to buy new nails. And I bought galvanized nails. Do you, know, do you know why we buy galvanized nails, anybody? Rust, they don't rust. Do you know what the problem is with galvanizing metal? Anybody? It, it makes them brittle. So I bought 10 nails, because I needed 10, <laughs> and I had to go back and buy more because I bent half of them, right? So I'd rather we look at software and connectivity like that, that when the use case is appropriate, when we need the rust proofing, you know, we make that choice. And when we can't afford the brittleness, we, we make a different choice. But we're not there yet. And I've often called this, I know you guys hate the word cyber, but guess what? When you talk to the outside world, you better get used to it. Um, so I call it cyber asbestos because we used asbestos everywhere. It was lightweight. It was fire retardant. It was such a miracle uh, material for builders. We put it in schools and hospitals and manufacturing facilities. We put that stuff everywhere for years. And then we found out it gave you cancer. And we had to condemn some of those buildings. And there's billions of dollars of class action lawsuits over that thing. Now, people still use asbestos, but they use it in less um, 
prominent, less, um, they don't use it everywhere. They use it where it makes sense and where it's safe to use. So I want to find that happy ground, right? Now we all groan about things like Heartbleed because it, it affected most people. I mean, it had a logo, it had a pretty you know, marketing campaign. But one of the things that, you know, when you're done your groaning is that OpenSSL is pretty much everywhere. There are certain open source libraries that make its way into lots and lots and lots of embedded systems. And the stories to me weren't so much, you know, that there was a bug in open source, and it wasn't so much that there was, you know, how long it had been there. It's more stories like when Rob Graham um, looked at the internet on day one, he found 600,000 systems nakedly exposed, affected by Heartbleed. And he would do a monthly scan with MassScan, and six months later it was about half of the, actually the first three weeks I think it was, half of them got patched. But he kept scanning year, month after month after month, and the last half never got patched. And when people looked into why aren't these things getting patched, they were in industrial control systems. They were in embedded systems. They were in places that needed the, the software but couldn't be updated. They were essentially for everyday bugs. And some of these places they landed are mission critical, life critical, safety critical systems. So when you're gonna depend on things like open source, which everything does, whether it's bash bug or, or whether it's open SSL or whether it's the one that's hitting hospitals right now, which is a flaw in, uh, it's basically the Foxglove's law, but it's a serializer deserializer problem that was in JBoss, used by tons and tons and tons of people. In this particular case, it was a McKesson device. So when we depend upon these things everywhere, we've now invited weakness in a way that, yeah, we get the benefits of this stuff, but if we can't also patch it, we're in big, big trouble. And that's exactly what's been happening, right? We're finding OpenSSL and HTTP client and bash in medical devices, in our homes, in industrial control systems. In fact, one of the more um, responsive vendors on OpenSSL was Siemens, Siemens Industrial Controllers. Siemens as in the one that got hit by Stuxnet. So the, to their credit, they admitted how many of their very, very expensive industrial control systems were affected and they could patch themselves. Many of their direct competitors were also affected and could not patch themselves. So I still had arguments with car companies early on as to, uh, well, well, yeah, we use all that software, but we don't have to be patchable. Patchable adds an attack surface, right? And then there's shell shock, et cetera. So when I try to bring this home, I, I, saw that I showed this this morning, but it bears repeating. We know we're gonna get hacked. We know that cars are gonna get hacked often. The question is how much damage does it do? And everybody knows about the Haitian earthquake because it was on the news every single day and Bono was asking for money and the American Red Cross was asking for money and the, all the living presidents were asking for money. And it was a terrible, terrible, terrible tragedy. 235,000 people, I think it was. Uh, 230,000 deaths. It was a 7.0 Richter scale, flattened many of the buildings, they crushed everybody inside. Now, nobody heard of very few people heard of a much, much stronger earthquake in Chile six weeks later. It was 8.8 .8 Richter scale, and if you know math, it's logarithmic, it's a lot worse. 7.0, 8.8. It only killed 279 people, that's why we didn't hear about it. It was nowhere near as attention grabbing. And when all the scientists looked at all the different factors like population density and proximity to the epicenter and all these other things, why did 8.8 .8 only kill 279 people and a 7.0 killed uh, 230,000 people, and it was building codes. That was the number one contributor. Chile had building codes, Haiti did not. What shook buildings in Chile flattened buildings in Haiti. So it wasn't the presence of earthquakes and it wasn't the magnitude of earthquakes, it was do you have building codes? And we really don't have building codes for building software code. We don't, and honestly we probably threw up a little bit in our mouth when I said that, right? Because, but the thing is, we're taking this software that we can't defend anything. If you really challenge yourself, 100 of the Fortune 100 companies have had a loss of intellectual property. Every single PCI compliant merchant has lost credit cards. Our failure rate is about 100%. So everything we do on a long enough timeline fails us, right? We've given up entirely on prevention, right? Now it's all now detect and respond. How quickly can we detect and respond? But what's the response after somebody's been killed? You can't unkill them. You can reissue a credit card. You can do credit monitoring. You can't unkill somebody. And the reason it's been acceptable is those failures were not consequential failures, right? Nothing has really triggered the motivation to start to look at a need for a higher level of assurance of, of safety critical IT. And what's worse though is when we have our, our high consequence failure, it's gonna look a lot like this. 
And if you remember, you know, all, the whole auto industry knows that some, somebody's going to have a, the first car fatality. Everybody knows. And they've also, to their credit, they know that it doesn't matter which one gets hit first. It's going to hurt all of them. Because when there's a crisis of confidence, and that's the key phrase, when there's a crisis of confidence in the public to trust connected vehicles, they, my mother-in-law will be terrified, right? So when she saw the Jeep hack last summer, she stopped buying Jeeps. I'm not kidding. They, every, every, from the day I started dating my wife till now, they've been a Jeep family. But after last summer, they had to get a new car. They didn't get a Jeep anymore. And it's not that Jeep isn't able to secure themselves. It's that the confidence was shattered. Someone doesn't want a car that might do something un unexpected. In fact, I see uh, one of the guys from NHTSA, one of the quotes that, I, I'm, this is a little off script here, one of the quotes that really sunk in for me is we were so, the cavalry was so, so focused on getting them to have a culture change and a recognition of the existence of talented and persistent adversaries, the, the actual threat models, that what we, we tried to do it in a non-sensational way because we didn't want to scare my mother-in-law. Not fe th theoretically my mother-in-law, actually my mother-in-law. We didn't want to scare her. Because the truth is, whenever you talk about car hacking, some, somebody in the crowd says, oh, that's why I'm keeping my 1997 Civic. <laughs> and that bothers me for two reasons. Um, one is, um, you know, a, a, a newer car is so much safer than a 1997 chassis. I mean, so much safer. There's so many uh, safety and crash survival ratings improvements that have happened. I don't want people to be afraid of new cars. I want them on new cars, right? And the second thing is, and this is why I need to do the quote from the administrator from NHTSA. NHTSA is the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Basically, the last year we have stats for was 2014, and it was uh, 32,675 deaths in the US due to car accidents. And 94% of those were human error. We know the year over year went up about 8%. So if you do a little quick math, I'll do it for you. About 100 people every day die in a car. About 100 people. And 94% of them are human error. So therefore, if we can get to autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicles, we're going to save a lot of lives. While we've been here today, we've lost 50, 60, 70 people to avoidable vehicular accidents. So we're not Luddites saying we shouldn't have modern connected cars. The challenge, and this is very nuanced, is we need to compel the right motivation and, com and corrective action on the part of the automakers so that we can make our cars safer to preserve the trust that hasn't been shattered yet. Because the moment we shatter that trust, the moment people are afraid to trust these semi-autonomous vehicles or these connected vehicles, it, we're just postponing the life-saving advances that we could have. I know that seems a little unintuitive, right? Now, I'm not going to say I trust all technology, but the truth is my peripheral vision is only this good. But a car can see 365. I can be distracted or angry or tired, but the software won't be. So we're never going to take the human out of the loop entirely, but we have to help preserve that trust. So the, what the issue is not so much, and this is really what got through to them, it's not so much that they're going to have a failure. They know they're going to have a failure. The issue is, the response time at the moment for the current fleet of vehicles is so poor that it's going to look more like this. They won't, if you can't patch your vehicles, or if the patch is really manual and error prone, you're going to, that's what's going to shatter the confidence of the public. So I've started shifting them less away from can a car be hacked to are we ready for failure. Now one way we did that is on our first birthday two years ago at DEF CON, we, uh, we issued a five-star automotive cyber safety framework. We released it through Reuters. We did an open letter to all the car CEOs. And we essentially said, paraphrasing, look, you guys are masters of your domain. You've been making cars safer and safer year over year for the last 100 years. We're masters of our domain in cybersecurity. And now that cars are computers on wheels, our domains have collided, and we will be safer sooner if we work together. Here is a framework to work together. And the basic idea was, since all systems fail, you need to be prepared for failure. And I'm going to walk you through some of that um, in a bit. But uh, the basic principles like safety by design, third party collaboration, evidence capture, security updates, segmentation, isolation. This was not meant to be a PCI checklist. This was not meant to be prescriptive controls. It was not meant to be the finish line. It was meant to be the starting line. So you must be this tall to ride the internet of cars, that, that basic idea. And sadly, two years later, um, we're still many, many years from satisfying all these. And one of the, one of the really tough urge, emerging issues that I've been talking to NHTSA and the Auto ISAC and Congress about 
is number three is going to be a doozy, the evidence capture thing. Nobody wants to touch it, um, which we're going to talk about a little bit tomorrow, maybe a little bit today. But let me just show you the basic engineering principles I shared with them. So all systems fail. Yes, all of them. Um, there are no exceptions. And physical engineers know this. So back to speaking their language. This is an engineer, electrical and physical engineering discipline. So when you know all systems fail, we know cars crash. That's why we put so many crash survival features into them. So it's about can you fail in a predictable and graceful way. So what do we know about computer science? Very, very little. But we know that the more code you have, the more problems you have. I made a Biggie Smalls graphic. I wish I had thought to put it in here. But there's a certain unavoidable defect rate per thousand lines of code. We don't measure it per million lines of code. We measure it per thousand lines of code because there's defects in every single thousand lines of code. Now, really mature programs, they'll measure it by 10,000 lines of code. But there's a flaw rate per 10,000 lines. Now, Windows XP or Windows 7 had about 10 million lines of code in it. So think of all the problems you've personally experienced and the patch frequency and cadence for your Windows system, about 10 million. But a car has over 100 million. So they should be patching 10 times more frequently. When was the last time your car got patched for a security issue? Anybody? About a year ago for your Chrysler, right? Was it a seamless patch like Windows Update? <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Right. And I'm not, and you know what? To their credit, they, they updated it. Some of, these, some of the ones we've told cars about, they cannot be fixed. Uh, and I'm not beating on GM. GM's doing a fantastic job on a number of fronts. But what no one saw after all the, uh, the, cut, the um, discussion over the, the, the patch you had to go through is GM also patched a bug about a month later. And it took five years to fix. They did it, and it was over the air, but it took five years to do because it was a really hard problem to fix on really old legacy technology. So all right, I don't, I don't want to lose the rhythm. OK, so 10 times the lines of code means 10 times the number of security flaws. It's just a fact, right? Software isn't the problem, right? Software's been in cars a very long time. The problem is that we've been remote, given remote access of varying lengths and ranges over more and more and more over time. So the original sin, if the original sin in healthcare was meaningful use, the original sin, uh, this room will actually get my joke, uh, the original sin in cars was the government mandatory backdoor known as OBD2. So for emissions testing, we had to add a, a direct port onto the CAN bus to allow for diagnostics and emissions testing, et cetera, from the state of California. So that was one of the early ones. The second one also came from California. It was um, without requiring physical access to the car. It was the tire pressure monitors. And the tire pressure sensors were there to very, very short range, but they were there to make sure we had high fuel economy to cut down environmental impact. Because tires that are running a little low have poor gas mileage. But think about all the things you've added. You have Bluetooth so your smartphone can connect. And you have near field communications. And you have 4G LTE Wi-Fi standard in all GM vehicles. 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspots standard. Whether you want it or not, you get one. And I, I, I flipped out when I first did it. And before I was even friendly with Jeff Massimilla at GM, I said, I have a 4G LTE Wi-Fi hotspot in my, phone, in my car right now. My kids can use this to play on their iPads. But uh, this one can't kill the brakes, and yours can. So um, you know, level of remote activity. And the, for those of you who don't yet know how to manipulate CAN bus and haven't gone to the car hacking village, which is awesome, by the way, um, don't worry. You do know web browsers. And we've added third party app stores to a lot of these things. And a lot of them are running on really, really familiar and really, really vulnerable web browsers. So the stack is becoming more familiar to us, which means it's becoming more familiar to adversaries. So it's, it's not the presence of software, per se. It's the number and variety of remote attack surfaces. And that's why Chris and Charlie were able to do this over the Sprint network. Because you know, Dan Gear has this uh, line. Well, I'll get to that in a second. So it's the number and, and variety of remote attack surfaces that are changing. And as you guys know, you know Bluetooth isn't very large range, but you can, you can amplify that significantly with a scope um, and whatnot. So then usually we get to the part where someone says, well, yeah, 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 of course they could kill you, but there's no money in it, right? Which, and I've even heard Chris and Charlie say there's no money in it. First of all, that's wildly uncreative. I can think of lots of ways to monetize car hacking. Um, bitcoins to start your car, you know, just, just a, a couple, right? Um, so when they say that no one would hurt you, um, we're not thinking, and we're conditioned in most of our careers, if you've been you know, in corporate security or pen testing or payment card industry, most of what we've done, our best practices, which suck, by the way, 
Um, when was the last time you did a pen test and didn't get in? Anybody? Okay. So most of it's focused on the confidentiality aspect of the CIA trinity and of regulated data, replaceable regulated data. We're not really well suited for people that want to do physical harm or that want to hurt the availability of mission critical systems. You know, most of our advice is still about confidentiality and breaches. So um, Bo likes to remind me that it's not just uh, adversaries, it's accidents and adversaries. And if you've ever done a threat modeling exercise, even if you, have, you, you think you have no natural predators, you still have one threat actor, Murphy, Murphy's Law, right? So um, also malicious intent is not a prerequisite to harm. Software have glitches, and no matter how much testing you do, there was this long protracted set of court cases over the unintended acceleration case where they brought in NASA scientists to look at the software complexity of the Toyota Lexus you know, braking system to see did a glitch lead to unintended harm? And without even trying to relitigate that here, we don't have to have the boogeyman to have concerns over cyber safety and vehicles. It's the software and the remote connectivity of that that's a big issue. In fact, the hospital in Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in Southern California got hit by the Sam Sam ransomware, which took advantage of that JBoss flaw in that McKesson device that could have been patched. And it locked up systems so badly they had to divert patients to other hospitals. So that piece of ransomware wasn't targeting Hollywood Presbyterian. It had no intention of hitting a hospital. It just happened to accidentally cause harm. And the same can be true in our automobiles. But you have to think a little more creatively, not to script kiddies or not to um, nation states who are equally as vulnerable to this, although they could do assassinations. But think about other adversaries like an ISIS or an ISIL. It's not that hard. And as we make these things more, um, as we lower the barrier to entry for these, and as we make them more connected, uh, this is yet another way to scare people or to hurt people. You know, we wrote a piece um, for a government agency on, a, on an attack scenario for New York City. Kill all the Lincolns in the Lincoln Tunnel was the opening sentence. So if you do a kill bit on the wildly vulnerable, unpatchable thing in a lot of some of these different makes and models of vehicles, um, you could disable any ingress or egress out of Manhattan by hitting a few bridges and a few tunnels. You don't have to hit every car. You just got to hit a sufficiently representative number of them so it would take days to tow them out. So how'd you like to cut off food and water and throw up a, you know, some sort of you know, attack credit for that? How'd you like to combine that with a Hollywood Presbyterian style attack? So we don't want to scare people and use scare tactics, but one thing that shocked me this morning, so I'm going to repeat it again. When Jericho and I researched Anonymous for two years, we had two and a half years, we wrote the Building a Better Anonymous series, we said that we were less concerned with what Anonymous is doing and more concerned with what comes next. And I meant that someone was going to pick up and perfect the blueprint of the use of social media and asymmetric warfare and all the things they were doing right. But this is not even you know, a theoretical anymore. There were very, very, very few hackers in Anonymous. Most of us know that. One of the hacking crews was Team Poison. One of the members of Team Poison, Janayad Hussein, the guy who, who attacked Tony Blair's website through Team Poison, he left the UK. He moved to Raqqa. He started the cyber caliphate. He was training and recruiting people to use Shodan, to use Metasploit. Really low-hanging fruit. You don't have to be a super elite hacker to use some of these freely available tools. And shortly after DEF CON last year, he was killed with a drone strike. And I'm shocked at how few of our friends here in Vegas this week even know that happened. But think about what you could do if you wanted to hurt people. And the answer is you could do a lot. But anyhow, to quote Dan Gear, you know, um, on the internet, every sociopath is your next door neighbor. So you're kind of hoping that zero people out of seven billion have the means, motive, and opportunity to hurt you. That's not good math. Not only is there, what, 1% of the global population is a sociopath, uh, and some of them are likely to be hackers, we actually know a few of them, and we go drinking with them this week. <laughs> um, so I don't want to be in a situation where I hope they wouldn't hurt me. I want to know they couldn't hurt me. So back to this five star. If we know failures will happen, can we put some scaffolding in place to make sure that when failures occur, we're prepared for failure? So I like the names that we put in our original document, but I so much wish I had just said it this way. How do you avoid failure? How do you take help avoiding failure without suing the helper? How do you capture, study, and learn from failure? How do you have a prompt and agile response to failure? And how do you contain and isolate failure? So I'm going to put some names and faces on this. And again, this is more for the outside audience than for you guys. And even if you do these things, you will still be hacked. But the question is, how much damage can that do? You know, the Chris and Charlie thing, let them put their tracksuit image on your, your center console for the Uconnect. 
but don't let them shut off the brakes. Why are critical systems directly connected to non-critical systems, right? And there's historical reasons why they are, and some of them are good reasons, and some of them are not good reasons. So safety by design, do you have a published attestation of your security life cycle? You can just say we do nothing, you can say nothing, but allow the free market to be able to assess yours from somebody else's. So Microsoft kind of does this with their SDL, their SDLA, and this just created a way for us to talk to them about do they do threat modeling? And for the first six months, we said, which threat modeling system do you use? And after six months of asking that question, and every single response was, what's threat modeling? Um, we stopped asking that question. But it became a way to not say, do you have a security program, but rather let, let's look at how strong your maturity is on different aspects of your security development lifecycle. Third party collaboration. Do you have a public attestation, uh, or do you have a published coordinated disclosure policy involving uh, assistance of third party researchers acting in good faith? And of many of our victories between what Jen Ellis has been working on and Katie Mazuris has been working on and the NCIA process, this is where we've had the most success. Um, but basically, let's put it in really simple terms. Do you have a beware of dog sign implicitly there that you're going to send cease and desist letters and lawyers at someone who brings you a bug? Or do you have a welcome mat? And that was one of my favorite parts of Mary Barra's keynote was she actually used the firm welcome mat uh, on the vital importance of working with third party researchers. Evidence capture is the one that's going to be really, really hard for a bunch of reasons uh, that aren't obvious. Um, but do your vehicle systems provide tamper evident, forensically sound, logging and evidence capture to facilitate safety investigations? Everybody knows what one of these are. And aside from the fact that it recorded the conversations in the cockpit, which we were never asking for, um, the first thing that happens when a plane crashes is we call the NTSB, National Traffic Safety Review Board or whatever, something like that. I can't remember the name. The very first thing to look for is the black box. So whenever something is you know, lost at sea, we only have so much time before we can recover that vital black box. If it's so vital to preserve the safety of the industry, and to preserve trust in the industry, why isn't anybody freaking out that there's zero cars that have one? Zero. So we aren't tamper evident. It took six months, I believe, Chris and Charlie said, of failed attempts before they successfully got their payload to work. So we would have had six months of tampering reconnaissance and, and failure to notice and maybe shut down ports, right? Um, we keep claiming there's no one's ever been killed in a car crash due to hacking, but we have no evidence collection to ever prove otherwise. It's very circular. So this one's a fairly important one. And it turns out that the largest opponent in the entire ecosystem is actually the privacy guys. It's not the industry. The industry actually wants these. Um, so we have some very strange fights to have and discussions on can this be done in a privacy neutral way. And when we wrote the standard, we, we actually said this can be done in a completely privacy neutral way. And the irony is the most, what's the most, I'm not even going to name it yet. What's the most privacy conscious country on the planet? Anybody? Germany. Germany. Guess who just announced last Monday that they're going to require black boxes in all their cars? Germany. So if Germany can figure out how to do this, and we're going to, we are direct, Bo and I just had a call with the embassy. Um, we're going to directly work to help sure it's a good one. But the U.S. is so afraid to get, you know, get in fights with the privacy advocates, but somehow Germany is going to find a way through. Um, so this one's a really, really, really important one. Um, just like in, in, you know, in the hospital environment, you do a mor morbidity and mortality, you do a post-mortem, you do an autopsy, you want to study and learn from what happened, what went wrong, how do we improve ourselves. And that's not going to be possible until we start capturing evidence in a consistent way. Security updates, uh, can your vehicles be securely updated in a prompt and agile manner? Um, Initially, they fought us like tooth and nail on this one. They said, ah, oh, it's going to add an, an attack surface. It adds, it adds complexity. And although we don't know how to secure a web browser, we do kind of know how to do a secure update process. Like it's, you know, it's, a, it's a tractable problem. And yes, it may add an attack surface to this over the air, but it also gives you the ability to have a prompt and agile response so you're not the deep water horizon oil spill for weeks and weeks and weeks. So, you know, this is something like every single day your, your phone apps are updating, Microsoft's updating, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a similar kind of idea. You know what? If they want to do it the more expensive way through the dealer, physically, sending USB keys, whatever, fine, let them. But ironic, what blew my mind is one of the companies that screened at me said they would never do it. On a subsequent meeting, I said, how much does it cost to do a recall, like a physical recall? And we went through the math. And I said, you know how much brand damage you get whenever you have a recall in the news? And they said, oh, yeah, we know exactly how to calculate it. It's this much, this much, and this much. I said, wouldn't a software update have less stigma than an op you know, just a routine software update? And wouldn't it cost a lot less on labor and shop time? And like the next month, they announced that they were going to head to uh, 
remote over-the-air updates. Not because they made the car safer, but because it saved a ton of money. So I really don't care why they do it, I just care that they do it. And then segmentation and isolation. This is the idea of do you, um, do you describe how you separate your physical and logical systems to keep, um, excuse me, physical and logical isolation measures to separate critical systems from non-critical systems. Some of these guys use the equivalent of a VLAN. Uh, some of them do nothing. Some of them have a security gateway, but it just lets everything through. Some of them use uh, virtualization and process isolation. Um, I don't really care what they do per se, but I, wanna, I think we should be taking steps. In fact, the one I've seen that's done the best is Tesla. Um, it, the ab absolutely intentional different uh, communication mechanisms for infotainment versus um, physical safety. Uh, and the idea here is a submarine has floods, can flood compartments without sinking the whole ship. Uh, the problem with the CAN bus isn't the CAN bus uh, controller, controller area network. It's the fact that once you're on it, you pretty much have unfettered access to everything else, pretty much. There's things that they do to try to prevent abuse, and all of them are defeatable. Uh, if you don't know that, talk to Craig Smith, the guy who started Open Garages. Or go to the car hacking village, he'll just show you, almost. Um, so one of the issues there, back to that Civic, I told you there were two reasons I hated the idea of keeping your Civic. Now that we have these wonderful things like progressive dongles from your insurance companies, or Verizon's Hum, or all this bevy of uh, little Indiegogo Kickstarter size projects that plug into that OBD2 port, you just took an unhackable 1997 Civic and you just made it hackable. So, um, because once you're on that bus, you're in big trouble. And I just shared a long train ride with the CEO of a car company in the, in the trucking industry, tractor trailer trucks. And his technology works through OBD. And, and they're very, very, very concerned about those massive amounts of steel um, you know, being hackable through a lot of that stuff. Because they almost all depend on lots of aftermarket OBD2 technologies. So even if you don't think those tractor trailers are hackable, they, they've just become hackable. Um, for those reasons. And when you kind of put this into context, many of us are like, but Josh, this stuff's really, really basic. Yes, it's really, really basic, but you have to understand where they are on their journey. They just woke up about a year ago and realized they were software companies, and it's not excusing their behavior. But they have no idea what they're doing here. And I think back to Microsoft 17 years ago sending cease and desist letters to our buddies. Maybe you even have one on your wall. But then you had Katie Mazuris you know, issuing a six-figure cash prize through Microsoft's Blue Hat program. And some people here at B-Sides have received that six-figure cash prize. So how do you go from cease and assist to six-figure cash prizes? So I call that the meantime to enlightenment. And for Microsoft, it was 15 years, right? But how do we compress that meantime to enlightenment to three, to two? Because there, we're not going to snap our fingers and have these very old, very large very tough uh, market um, participants all of a sudden wake up enlightened. But what we can do is be patient enough to get them to crawl, to walk, to run, to give them a pathway there and not be a pointing finger, but instead be a helping hand. And not focus on past failures, but focus on future success. And not tell them all the things they're doing right, but also, um, all the all things they're doing wrong, but also tell them the things they're doing right. And even if they do all of these five star things, they're still going to be hackable. But at least I think that we're maybe better prepared to to contain and, and respond to and notice those failures. And I just want to end before I go to questions on a couple of, of the successes, right? Tesla does not have 100 years of baggage and legacy to worry about, so that's in their favor. And they've, and they've been freaking awesome, right? They have a bunch of security and software engineers they hired day one. They did threat modeling. They hired security people on staff. And they were the world's first automaker to have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. And for that, they need a round of applause, right? They, they also set the model of crawl, walk, run without even knowing they were doing it. They had money to issue bounties day one, but they didn't go right for that. They wanted to see how many bugs. They wanted to see uh, what kind of bugs, what kind of variety. Are we going to get flooded? Is this going to be noise? So six months into the program, they realized, okay, we have more capacity, and they offered a cash prize. I think it was up to 1000 bucks. And then six months later, they upped it to 10000 So they showed that you don't have to go from zero to six-figure cash prizes from Microsoft. There is a way to ramp up. Now, I don't have a screenshot for it, but let's also give a round of applause to GM. GM, this January, was the first traditional manufacturer. And it was much harder for them to get through their red tape. 
and they offer a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program. Uh, so let's give a round of applause to GM. And I'm going to postpone it for now, but you know, I, I was one of the voices discouraging them from offering cash prizes initially. Um, there's a lot of good reasons I discouraged it, and they will be, and they have budget, and they are doing private hackathons uh, with prizes. Um, but that's a different discussion. And then third, uh, in the last month, um, Fiat Chrysler, FCA, offered through Bug Crowd their first uh, bug bounty. They went straight for a bug bounty. So they do have a small cash prize, um, but they also are saying we will not sue third party researchers acting in good faith who follow our policy. So let's give a round of applause for Fiat Chrysler. <laughs> now, if you were in the medical sessions, the, one of the reasons it was so powerful to hear Suzanne Schwartz from the FDA is when we tackled automotive first, it's because there's only about 20 OEMs. So we knew that one at a time we could wear them down and finally make it a tractable problem. But when it comes to medical devices, there are thousands and thousands of device manufacturers. So we had to take a more centralized approach. Um, and uh, more recently, um, NHTSA has been very helpful here. And the guidance that was about to come out and is soon to come out, you know, they, they've been very pro-coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And I think that's really the gateway drug in the five star is once people start receiving bugs and they start seeing researchers as an asset, as a teammate, instead of a threat, uh, they might find more bugs, find them sooner, get them fixed, start to realize the need for more containment and isolation, start to realize the need for prompt and agile updates, et cetera, et cetera. So back to that five star, the failures are gonna happen, but are you prepared to avoid failure, take help avoiding failure, learn from failure, respond to failure, and isolate failure? And the way I put this finally to them is, is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio, I said this this morning, so it's a repeat for a few of you. Andrea Matwishan, who's speaking here, she's a law professor. When we did our Constitutional Congress for the Cavalry at DerbyCon almost, you know, a little after, almost three years ago, so it was after DEF CON, um, she kind of said, hey guys, um, nothing's gonna change until people die. You're gonna need your burning river on fire moment. If you don't know the history, the, the, the river in Ohio, uh, the Cuyahoga River near Cleveland, caught on fire and stayed on fire many times. And ultimately, somebody got a picture for Time, I think it was Time Magazine, and it finally triggered corrective, corrective action like the Clean Water Act and things like the EPA. But it, it, it took really bad things. Like how bad does pollution you have to get before you have a burning river on fire? How do you even put that out? But they did. And this was not even the, the, the worst of the fires. It's just the one they got on, on picture. Um, so we may have to have that high consequence failure. But the, the problem is the 2019 models are already done for some of these manufacturers. And the supply chain that goes into them are done even further out. So unless they anticipated perfectly without our help all the kind of smart uh, security defensive things they needed to do, the, the response times are gonna be very, very slow. So I don't wanna wait for a burning river on fire moment. I don't wanna wait for my mother-in-law to have a crisis of confidence in connected vehicles. I wanna preserve that trust so that we can more quickly save the 100 people per day that die to, due to human error. Um, and if you think individual cars are bad, just look at vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure stuff, which is a mess. Um, and again, NHTSA has taken a leadership position there, and they've done a lot to have a privacy by design protocol that's been worked on for 12 years. But the, the, where this whole system breaks down is for, there's, a, there's one security principle we do know, which is that security is not composable, which says if you take secure thing A and secure thing B and you put them together, you might not have a secure AB. But what, the inverse corollary of that is you could never take an insecure car A and any other car and have a secure network of cars, right? And if you've talked to Cesar Ceruto, who talks about smart cities and hackable infrastructure, most of the roadside equipment that would be participating in this vehicle infrastructure is passing stuff in the clear on purpose by design. Um, so I'm very, very worried about the system of car, the internet of cars. And there have been some congressional hearings on this, and there has been some good work, but more is needed, and we're gonna need more help from more people when we get to that stage. But we focus very, very deliberately on individual cars and individual car companies because the system will never be secure if we don't have secure participants within that system. So the road ahead, just a few nods to some, new, some existing and new uh, initiatives. Individual bugs scare and polarize the auto industry. So I know we like to think that if we drop O'Day or if we do a high profile attack, it'll trigger corrective action, but it tends to trigger an immune response. 
and it tends to hurt trust if it's not done carefully. Um, but there are some people who have had projects for a while now that have been building trust and building up a, a, a community of interest and talent. So one of them is one of the, the most talented but least extroverted is Craig Smith who founded Open Garages a while back when he still lived in Ohio and now he's in uh, I think Seattle. So Open Garages is, is something that you could start in your own town. It's basically a, a platform to teach students and me mechanics and anybody that wants to tinker on cars how to hack and how the car's electronic systems work. And he's one of the guys who helped found the car hacking village at DEF CON later this week. So definitely check that out. And one of the nice things about him and his tribe and his extended friends is they create lots and lots of free and open source tools. Um, so to truly build up a, a, a community, you need to teach other people how to do this stuff. And they're very good on sharing because their focus is on safety and protecting, uh, less so on, on the, the public stuff. There's also a new initiative that was originally in Intel, um, but people thought it was an Intel scheme, but it wasn't at all. Uh, it's called, now it's a 501c6 nonprofit called ASRB. Automotive uh, Safety Review Board. And their idea is they want to have uh, self-healing networks of cars by 2025, right? Or 20, 2030 or whatever. It was like this big audacious goal, but they want to think past individual car protection and think about which technologies are missing that will allow us to notice failures or attacks in one area and dynamically heal fleets of vehicles and things like that. So um, in full disclosure, I'm the, I'm the chair of the tech steering committee, but what we did is we took a mixture of breakers and fixers. So I'm more on the blue team type side. And they have people like Mike, Mark Rogers, who was one of the, the Tesla hackers. Um, uh, they have people like Craig Smith. They have some folks from academia that do uh, car hacking. So we have about an equal mix of people that know how to break cars and are really experienced at breaking cars, but also people who think that instead of just breaking cars over and over, maybe we should look at alternative reference architectures and alternative designs. So the idea of the spiral here is we want to always have a fusion of an old priest and a young priest or a blue teamer and a red teamer um, to look at future stuff. So the deployed fleet is sunk costs and it's really hard to fix. The deploying fleet is the stuff that's coming off the factory line right now and you might not be able to change the supply chain, but you can at least harden stuff. And the, the future developing fleet is really where we want to focus. Um, so if people are in academia or are focused on future technologies to make cars safer and less hackable, um, please look me up for that. And um, I don't have a slide for them, but the auto ISAC didn't exist really other than a name until pretty much January. And the auto ISAC, just like the other ISACs are information sharing analysis centers, um, they too are a nonprofit versus the government sponsored version. And it's right now mostly just the automakers, but they're creating participation levels for the tier one suppliers, and they're going to create a third tier participation for folks like I and the Cavalry and uh, civil society, non nonprofit groups to help. And that's less about you know maybe making cars less hackable and more about when cars are being attacked, threat information sharing, kind of like the FSI SAC and other ISACs currently do. Uh, and then I can't put a slide up, but I hear that the NHTSA's guidelines are done and just going through approval and Frank can't talk about it yet, but um, we believe based on previous writings they've done that it matches quite a few of the principles of the Cavalry's five star already as well. Things like the value of coordinated vulnerability disclosure and working with third party research communities. Um, so that's kind of an update on where the things are with cars. And again, everybody in this ecosystem is motivated differently, but my goal with conversations like this is hopefully that you are now more motivated to get involved. So that is the end of the prepared remarks. Thank you.